the goal in this last session is uh, to present yet another different um, compression result, interactive <coughs> compression result, which is arguably one of the central results in the field. And we will see that despite the impossibility result we saw in the last talk, uh, it is possible to beat the previous scheme in some other model of compression. So <laughs> just to recap, what is our problem? We're given a protocol that under some input distribution mu has reveals i bits of information. And our goal is to simulate it up to some small statistical error using a smaller communication protocol. So we want to compress uh, um, the original communication. And Rotem just so showed us that, if one, that such simulation can always be done using uh, exponentially many communication bits. So it's always possible to simulate a protocol using roughly two to the i uh, bits of communication. Unfortunately, as Rotem just explained, if one insists on compression, compressing uh, the protocol to a function which depends entirely on its information, then unfortunately there's nothing better we can do. So this, uh, this result is possible. So this is sharp in terms of the dependence on, on i. One cannot uh, beat this. And the natural thing to do besides give up at this point is to consider a more relaxed notion of compression which allows to somehow circumvent this impossibility result. And indeed, for all practical purposes, when you think of it, and, and also as we shall see for the direct sum application, it's sufficient to consider, it's good enough to, to prove uh, a weaker notion of compression, namely a compression that allows the compressed protocol to depend not only on the uh, information cost i, but also have a mild, a modest dependence on the original communication c. So when I say mild, we mean, okay, let's take a protocol with i bits of information, it's original uh, communication c, and you, you should think of c as being much, much larger than i, and we want to compress it to some function g of i and c bits of communication, and by mild dependence, we, we typically mean a sublinear dependence on c, right? So we started with c bits of communication. If we can compress to, let's say, i times log c or polylog c bits of communication, then this is very good. We made a lot of progress, right? So this is another more relaxed version of compression, which I guess is less usual to think about in the, in the double E community. But for all our application, for, for practical purposes, such compressions um, are good enough. Right, that's true. So uh, the idea is that in this model of compression, all we care about is making progress and shrinking C. Uh, so even if you can compress to something like I to the five times you know, C to the fourth, that's, that's good. As long as you shrink the communication, we're happy and we will see why we are happy with this. We will see the exact qual uh, quantitative application for, for the direct sum and for, for practical purposes. So let me try to convince you, just intuitively speaking, how, how such relaxed or weaker notion of compression can indeed make, uh, can help us make, make progress over the, the previous protocol. So to answer this, let's revisit the, the compression protocol that we, just, uh, that we just saw. So it uses two to the i uh, bits. And when you think of it, one spectacular feature, but somewhat conspicu uh, conspicuous feature of this protocol is that despite the fact that the original protocol had potentially multiple number of rounds, the two to the i compression is not, in, not an interactive scheme, right? It was essentially a one-way protocol. Alice just computed all the, the set of all potential uh, candidate transcripts, transmitted them to, to, to Bob and, ho and hoped for the best, right? And then Bob just either rejected or uh, accepted. And the price to pay for this non-interactivity is, is, is exactly what causes us uh, the blow of the exponential blow up in the number of transcripts, right? So it requires the enumerating over exponentially many transcripts. And essentially, this scheme only gives us something in the, in the regime where i is, is sublogarithmic, where 
where i is, is at most log c, right? If i is, is more than log c bits, then 2 to the log c is c. So we, we're, we're right, right back, back where we started from, right? So we made no progress. And this is somewhat uh, unfortunate in the intuition that somehow interacting in a clever way can help us, as Rotem insinuated before, it can help us prune parts of the, the protocol transcripts they kind of throw away the incorrect protocol transcripts and, and focus our search in a faster way. Okay, so this is a very hand wavy intuition. We will try to, to formalize this. And again, kind of the, the, the trivial example that Rotem gave uh, last time is where Alice and Bob just uh, interleave and back and forth and s send each other uniform bits, right? So if they send each other k uniform bits, of course, there's a trivial compression scheme that only communicates k bits. It's just the original protocol, right? However, the 2 to the i compression would communicate 2 to the k bits. This is very inefficient in this case, right? So again, this is just a very, very uh, rough intuition. But it turns out this can be uh, formalized. So the breakthrough uh, theorem of Barak, Braverman, Chen, and Rao showed that any protocol with information i and communication c can be compressed roughly to the geometric mean of its information and communication, right? So if you think of c being, you know, much larger than i, let's say 2 to the 2 to the i, then we're indeed making a lot of progress, right? We, we're compressing, we're essentially getting a, a quadratic savings in our, um, in our communication cost, right? And just as a remark, just to convince you that this, this model of, of weaker compression really can, can gain us a lot, then in fact they also have a result which we will not discuss this time, but I'll just uh, put it out there. So if the input distribution uh, mu is a product distribution, so if Alice's input x is independent of, of Bob's input y, it turns out that we can compress almost all the way down to i, which is the optimal rate. So we can compress to something like i times log squared c. So this is a really powerful um, model uh, to consider. And so just the logarithmic dependence on c already gets us um, a lot of mileage. But as we said, we will focus on, on the central theorem. And to prove it, before we give, uh, uh, we, we dive into the technical details, uh, let me just say that it will be useful to view the interactive compression task uh, equivalently as the task of sampling uh, paths in, a, in the communication tree, in the, in the protocol tree of, 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 um, of Pi. So what is the protocol tree? Every communication protocol we can, and you essentially, you've seen this in the past two talks by Mark and Rotem, you can essentially view any protocol as a binary uh, tree. Um, and again, we will assume for, for this part of the talk that each, each message communicates only one bit. Again, like Mark said, this is without loss of generality up to a factor of two in the communication. We're going to compress it anyway, so we, we don't really uh, uh, care about this. So each, each message consists of one bit. And like Rotem said, we, we will fix the public randomness because uh, this is also without loss of generality. And then the protocol tree is, is built as follows. So, in each um, node of the protocol tree corresponds to some partial path, so the history of message, messages being, uh, that have been transmitted so far. And in each, each such node, the, the next message, suppose Alice is the speaker in this, in this node, she can communicate either a zero or a one, so each node has a left child and a right child. And it is associated with some Bernoulli distribution on the, over the private randomness of the player of whether a zero or a one is being communicated at, at this point. Does that make sense? And as we said, so Alice owns the odd nodes of this tree, and then Bob speaks, and then Alice owns the, 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 the even, the, the odd node, the odd uh, layer again, and so forth. So, this tree gives rise to all the possible, just the support of all possible transcripts that the protocol can end up with. So in this terminology, what, is, what does the interactive compression task amount to? The players simply want to sample um, a correctly distributed path according 
industry. So what does it mean? Alice will toss a coin, will send her first message, then Bob is going to speak. He's going to choose, let's say, uh, the, the, right, the right child, then Alice will speak again, and so forth, and they will sample um, a leaf, which is just a root to leaf uh, a transcript, and the interactive compression task is to sample such a leaf using minimum communication as possible, right? So the trivial way to do it is just follow the path. The depth of this tree is C, is exactly the, the, the say the, the, the longest path is worth C bits of communication. We want to do this much more efficiently. All right, so this view will be um, useful for, for the scheme we're about to describe. And what is the high level approach of, of the compression we're about to see? So remember, our goal is to take a protocol with I bits of information, C bits of communication, where C is much, much larger than I, and simulate it with much smaller communication. And the idea, has, as we've seen in, in the compression scheme that Rotem presented, is to try and avoid communication by trying to guess uh, what the other player is about to say. Right? Where the guiding intuition throughout the proof is that if the information that the protocol reveals is low, then most of the time these guessing will, will succeed and the players will be able to save a lot of communication instead of just communicating uh, brute, uh, brute force. The, so the thing we'll try to explain in the next few, uh, two slides is what does it formally mean that Alice tries to guess Bob's bit? We, we, we saw one variant that uh, Rotem presented. And this one is going to be similar in spirit, but, but somewhat more fine-grained. So what does it mean for Alice to try and guess what Bob is about to say? So remember, their goal is to sample a path in the protocol tree. So for each node, W of the protocol, remember W corresponds to the message transcript, a partial transcript that's been sampled so far. Alice has some Bernoulli distribution over what is the next bit she's going, that's going to be transmitted in the protocol, right? So if, it, if it's an odd, if W is an odd node, Alice is the owner of this node, so she has the correct distribution on this node, right? She knows exactly uh, the correct distribution in, in the, in, in the right uh, distribution of wh what is um, the probability of sampling a 0 or, or a 1 for the next message. What does Bob have in mind? Well, Bob doesn't have x, so he can't compute this probability exactly, but he always has a prior distribution, right? He can compute, he can always, like we saw in Rotem's talk, he can always um, do the best he can. So his best estimate is to condition on his input y in the, in the history of the protocol. Right, and of course, if W is an even node, that the, then the roles are reversed. Bob will have the correct distribution, and Alice will have the prior estimate. And once again, the interactive compression uh, goal is to jointly sample a leaf T, which is just a transcript of the protocol, according to the correct distribution, which is just the interleaved product of taking Alice's view of the world in the odd nodes and Bob's view of the world in the even nodes. All right? Great. So given those, you know, having formalized what those guesses mean, the natural idea for, for compressing is the following. So instead of communicating as usual, the, the players will just try to sample full paths of the transcripts where Alice will sample the odd nodes according to the right distribution that she already has. And for the even nodes, well, she doesn't know the even distribution, but she has a prior for it, so she will use the prior distribution to sample the, the even nodes. Does that make sense? So for all the, the first message Alice has, she, she knows how to sample it. For the second message, she will, she will use her estimate and so forth. And Bob will do the same. So each of the players will obtain a, a, a path in the tree. And of course, some errors occur, right? So they have some inconsistencies in those paths emanating from the fact that neither of them knows the, the correct distribution. So now, and here comes the interactive part of this scheme, they will try to go and correct those errors one by one until they agree on a consistent transcript. OK, so again, this is still a high level view, but this is what's going to go on in the scheme. OK, so. Let's just, so, okay, so every talk has kind of zero or one important slides, and this is the one, so 
try to stay tuned. So the point is that in order for, so what, is, what was our intuition? The intuition is that if Alice's prior distribution on what Bob is about to say is, is really close to the true distribution, then the players will agree, they will try to guess, the, the guesses will, will succeed and they will sample correctly and they will, will be able to save communication using this procedure. And it turns out that the technical way of, 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 um, of doing so is by correlating the player's guess. Okay, so let me, before I say what the players are actually about to do, suppose that Alice knows exactly what Bob is about to say. So suppose that uh, Bob's bit conveys, conveys zero information. If the players try to guess to sample the next message using independent randomness, even if they have the same distribution in mind, they will disagree with probability as big as half, right? If they use independent samples. So the point is to correlate those samples and they'll do this using public randomness. And this is really the crucial part of this uh, scheme. So suppose the players have sampled all the, the, the correct tra uh, transcript up to some you know, node W. This is what they do in the, in, for, for, for this node. This is how they, they're going to sample the, the next uh, node. So again, Alice has uh, some distribution in mind PX. And suppose the node W is odd, so she has the correct distribution. And Bob has some prior distribution P of Y. Now the players are going to draw a uniform number rho for each such node of the protocol. And this just, right, so this is just a uniform number between 0 and 1. And each player will set his next message, the guess, is going to be 1 if this, if the dart exceeded the threshold. Does that make sense? So again, so if in this case, the dart fell to the left of both players' estimates. So both of them will guess that the next transmitted message is going to be zero. Okay? So the, impor the first important thing to notice is that the marginal distribution of, of each guess is correct, right? What is the marginal probability that Alice is going to, uh, to sample a zero? It's exactly P of X, why, right? Because because the probability of getting a zero here, remember, the, the dart was completely uniform between zero and one. So the probability of seeing a zero is exactly P of X for Alice and P of Y for Bob. Right? The crucial thing, and this is where uh, the correlation comes into play, we want to say that if the information, if the divergence between those distributions is, is low, then the probability of making a mistake is low as well. And indeed, what is the probability that the players sample different messages, that Alice samples a 1 and Bob samples a 0, or vice versa? It's exactly the event that the dart fell between those estimates, right? So this probability is precisely the statistical distance between Alice's distribution and Bob's distribution. Okay, so this is going to be crucial. So if there are any questions, feel, feel free to ask. All right, so, uh, so the, the, the point is that so far no communication has, has occurred, right? So the, the, the way the protocol, the compressed protocol will work is that the players will repeat this process. They will sample using public randomness this number for each node of the tree. So there are exponentially many nodes in the tree. So this seems very inefficient, but so far no communication at all has occurred. Okay, and we, we will see, so we're getting to the full protocol. I just want to make sure this, this part makes sense. Okay, so just by, defi by, just by the definition of this process, it gives rise to two subtrees of the protocol, right? Alice has um, a subtree that corresponds to all of her guesses, the outgoing edges from all the nodes in the protocol, and Bob has his own guesses. And this is the starting point of our, of our protocol. So let's try to see a, a visualization of this. So the players begin by just sampling using public randomness these darts row for each node of the protocol using absolutely no communication so far. So for the first node, let's say they guess this one, then for, and they do this for every node in the tree. All right, so 
Alice knows only the black tree, the black edges, and Bob knows only the red edges, right? What I claim, and which is almost immediate to see, is that the intersection of those subtrees uh, defines a unique path which has the correct distribution, right? If we follow the black edges on odd nodes and the red edges on even nodes, then this gives right, because, because every subtree, every node has exactly one outgoing edge in each tree, then there's a unique path that stems from the intersection of those trees, subtrees. All right, so the goal really is to find the path that stems from the intersection of those two trees. And I claim this is exactly, this path will be correctly distributed by definition, right? Because if we follow the black edge in the first node and then Bob's red edge in the second node, then Alice's edge in the third node and Bob's edge in, in, in the fourth, we, we arrive at this, um, at this node. And how are the players going? So, so, so far there was no communication whatsoever, right? But some errors occurred. So the players are going to find those errors one by one, correct them until they reach this, uh, this, this leaf, which, is, which lies in the intersection of those trees. All right? So let's see how this is going to happen. I'm not going to show you right now how they do find the first, um, the, fir the first error, but we will see this in a second. But suppose you believe me that it is possible to find the first mistake of the protocol efficiently. So the protocol proceeds as follows. The players will find the first mistake. In this case, it's in the second node, right? The first node was perfect. They, they both guessed the correct uh, 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 message. In the second node, they have a disagreement. So they will correct according to the correct speaker. Who's the correct speaker in the second node? This node is owned by Bob. So they need to correct according to the red edge, right? So Alice will correct according to Bob's edge. What is the, the, okay, so they corrected this edge. What is the next mistake? It occurs in the third node, right? They have a disagreement here as well. Who's the speaker in this node? Alice is the speaker, it's an odd node, right? So they will correct according to Alice. And the fourth node, luckily, they guessed correctly, so they will arrive at the correct path, right? So again, they will just, um, so almost by definition, if they run this procedure recursively, they will arrive at the correct node. So correctness, correctness almost uh, essentially follows by, by definition. The question is, what is the communication of this protocol? All right, so the central definition in the, in the next 10 minutes of the talk is the notion of a mistake. So let's formalize what does it mean to have a mistake. So we say that a mistake occurred, occurred in the i level of the protocol if the outgoing edges from the node, from the, the partial transcript that was sampled so far is inconsistent in the trees of Alice and Bob. So again, suppose the players have sampled, the, they fixed all the messages up to the ith layer. Now for the ith node, both of them again have guesses for the next message, right? That they use the public uh, randomness for. And we say that they made a mistake if those outgoing edges are inconsistent. If Alice guessed a 1 and Bob guessed a 0 or vice versa. All right, so um, yeah, so so once we formalize what it formally means to, f to find them, to, to have a mistake, then comes the question how, okay, so how, how much communication is required to find the first mistake, let's say. And we essentially saw this in, in Rotem's talk. So it's, it essentially um, amounts to the, to the uh, task of comparing the, the, the inputs. In fact, the, here the players want a little bit more. They want to find the first deferring index not just any separating index. And it's not hard to see that if the players want to do this with zero error, then there's nothing they can really do. Alice and Bob need to transmit their entire uh, transcripts. But if you're willing to pay a small error, then in fact, a very efficient protocol exists. So you can do this using only log C over epsilon bits. OK, so, so again, so just to recap, at this point, suppose we started the root, Alice and Bob both have a, a unique path from root to leaf, which is each party's guess. And now they need to find the first mistake, the first place where these paths diver diverges. The length of this path is c bits, because the depth of the tree is c. 
So they need to pay, they can do this with error epsilon using logarithmically many bits of communication. So this is good news because this task is actually a very easy task. It, it costs us only, it, has, it depends only logarithmically in C. Of course, we want to set the error epsilon small because errors accumulate over rounds, right? So we want to have uh, a low enough error to overcome a union bound over all the, um, the, the, the levels of the protocol. But even if we set epsilon to be as small as 1 over C squared, let's say, which is good enough for a union bound over all C layers, we still only pay, the dependence on epsilon here is very good, so we still only pay order log C bits and this ensures that with very high probability, no error will ever occur in this process of finding mistakes. All right, so if you're confused by now, then just assume we have a black box primitive that you can think of succeeding with probability one even, that allows Alice and Bob to track the next error at each point. And the cost of this black box primitive is, is only logarithmic, which shows that the expected communication of tau is essentially comparable to the number of mistakes that it makes, right, up to a logarithmic factor. All right, because each mis finding each mistake cost us log C bits. Correcting each mistake is just, you know, we correct it according to the correct speaker. So the communication is comparable to the amount of mistakes the, the protocol makes on expectation. Right, so just at this point, it's a good point to mention that even you know, even the protocol was not that trivial. You have to appreciate the analysis here. The analysis is really, so um, the, the analysis, all that remains right now is to, to estimate, the, the, to upper bound the number of mistakes the protocol makes on expectation. So though we are not quite finished, this is a, an appealing feature of, of the analysis. Okay, so to, f to finish the proof, we need to um, bound the number of mistakes and the heart of the proof is, prove is, is the following lemma that the expected number of mistakes the protocol makes is at most the, the geometric mean of the uh, information and communication. So to prove this we will use two basic facts. The first one I'm sure uh, you guys know better than us. So it's Pinsker's inequality which says that the statistical distance between any two distributions is at most square root the, the KL divergence. The second fact, uh, we'll use the following uh, definition. So we say, just to analyze the, the, um, the expression above, the number of mistakes, let's decompose it into the sum of indicator vari random variables that indicate whether a mistake occurred at level i or not. And the second fact, which you've also essentially seen in various forms uh, in the previous talks, is the Mar Markov uh, property feature of, uh, of communication protocols. So if I is an odd node, the probability that Alice will transmit a zero or a one given her input in the history of the protocol is not affected if we further condition on Y. Why is that? This is just the basic feature of communication protocols, right? The speaker's message only depends on his input in the history of the messages. Alice's input does not affect this distribution, okay? So just keep in mind throughout the analysis these two facts. All right, so here comes the, the main, this is essentially the only calculation we will do in this talk. So what is the expected, um, what is the expectation of the indicator variable? What is the probability we make a mistake in the ith layer? Well, by definition, it's the probability that the guesses of Alice and Bob, given the history, is different, right? What is the probability they make a mistake? It's just, we just, we've just seen, if you recall, a few slides ago that this, the mistake probability is just the statistical distance, just the difference between, the absolute distance between Alice's guess and Bob's guess, right? By definition of these priors, this is just the, the distance between uh, the probability that Alice, Alice is going to transmit a zero given her view of the world and the probability of transmission from Bob's point of the, uh, of the world. And using the second fact, remember we can always further condition on Y here. If, 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 double, if I is an odd node, then Alice is the owner of this node. It is not, the probability will not be affected if we further condition on Y. By Pinsker's inequality, okay, so 
the point of this slide is relating the probability of error to the information revealed by the ith message, right? This is the intuition that if the information is low, the probability of making a mistake is low. Pinsker's inequality can serve this, you know, converting the, the, the probability of error to the, the information revealed by the, 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 the ith message. So this equality, uh, inequality just follows from Pinsker's inequality. By concavity of the square root function, we can always bring the expectation inside. Okay? And does this term you know, remind you anything, if you didn't see the glimpse to the, to the next bullet? This is nothing else but the information revealed by the ith message of the protocol condition, you know, the, 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 expected, the, expect, the expected information revealed in the ith message condition on the history of the protocol. Okay, so conclusion, the probability, the average over the history of making a mistake in the ith layer of the protocol of tau is at most square root the information revealed by the ith message, which is exactly the type of relationship we're looking for. Of course, we would be very happy if we didn't have the square root here, but, and this is what eventually will kill us. We know this is uh, impossible to avoid it completely, but um, this is a useful bound. So let's just conclude the proof. What is the expected number of mistakes? Just by linearity of expectation, it's just the expectation of those, the sum of the expectation of the indicators. Each one of them by the previous lemma is at most square root the information. And of course, we can always add the second term, right? One of them is going to be zero. If Alice speaks, then the second term is going to be zero. If Bob speaks, the first term is going to be zero. In any case, it's a non-negative quantity, so we can always add it. Okay, so this stands from the previous slide. By Cauchy-Schwarz, we can always upper bound this by the square root of the sum of the squares. Okay? And now we're essentially done. So what is, what is the first sum? We're summing over C bits of communication. So the first, uh, the first sum is just C. And the second sum, just by the chain rule, is exactly the definition of the information cost, right? This sum is exactly the, the, the information of, of the protocol. Any questions? All right, so in conclusion, after roughly square root IC communication, the players obtain a correctly distributed path according to the correct distribution. And if we want to turn this expectation guarantee into a worst case, we can always you know, pay another log one over epsilon factor in communication, absorb another small error, and turn this into a worst case guarantee. So this pretty much concludes the proof. All right, and just a corollary of this is that, as Rotem said, so Rotem just told us that if we can compress all the way down to i, we get a perfect, a strong direct sum theorem. Well, unfortunately, this is impossible, as we've seen. But this slide tells us that any progress we do make in the, in, you know, the more general model of compression, if we do get a better and improved dependence on C, then we do get meaningful direct sum, non-trivial direct sum theorems. So this is, in, in fact, the state of the art, the, the best to date direct sum theorem which states that solving n independent copies of f takes, well, we can't hope for n times f, uh, the n times the communication of a single copy. What we do get from this compression scheme that it scales as, at least as square root the number of copies. And a quick proof sketch is, well, again, like it's, it's essentially uh, exactly the same argument like Otem said. So fix a protocol for the n-fold uh, copy that achieves the, the optimal communication of, 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 uh, of n copies. Remember that the embedding argument that Rotem showed us allows us to generate from the n-fold protocol uh, a single copy protocol whose information cost is at most the communication of the huge protocol divided by n. Every, okay? Unfortunately, the communication of this protocol is still huge because we, we used a huge n-fold protocol in order to execute, in order to solve a single copy. So the information is quite good. It gets slashed by n, but the communication is still large. But luckily, this is, this is exactly where we can use compression, right? Now we can compress this protocol 
using the BBCR compression into square root of the product of those quantities, which yields exactly this, this protocol. Just rearranging the sides yields this weaker direct sum. Okay, so the conclusion is that any progress you make on compression will give better and better direct sum results. And uh, as far as we know, even despite the, the counter example that Rotem just showed us, it's conceivable that we can get much better direct sum. So it's still not hopeless to, to, to compress better. In fact, uh, okay, so we'll get this, to this in two minutes. Uh, I'm kind of run, running out of time. I just want to convince you that, okay, so we've seen the analysis here. We went step by step and a natural thing, question to ask is whether this analysis is tight. So we saw a few inequalities and, you know, a conceivable answer is, is it just a matter of analysis? Can this protocol actually have better guarantees? Unfortunately, the answer is that it is tight. And as, as exhibited by the, the following uh, example, so consider the example where Alice has just n uniform bits. And Bob's input y is, is nothing. So Bob, in this case, doesn't have any input. And the protocol pi proceeds as follows. In each step of, of the protocol, from one to n, Bob transmits a very, very weak signal bias, with bias towards the right answer. So if, if his input is, is one, he transmits a Bernoulli half plus epsilon signal. Otherwise, if it's a zero, he transmits epsilon minus, uh, half minus epsilon signal. So this signal contains very, very little information, right? It's just slightly biased towards the right result. And we choose the bias for reasons which we'll see soon. The bias is going to be 1 over square root n. All right, so what is the information cost of this protocol? What is the information in a single step? Remember, all those bits were independent. It's not hard to see that the information is just the KL divergence between half plus or minus epsilon and half. And this divergence is roughly is order, n square, uh, order epsilon squared. Uh, bits of information. This shows that if we run this n steps, the protocol proceeds for n steps, then the overall information here is n times epsilon squared. Epsilon was 1 over square root n, so this amounts just to a constant bits of, number of uh, bits of information. Okay, so the information cost of this protocol is only constant, can be made to be 1, so just one bit of information. How many mistakes will the BBCR compression protocol make on this? Unfortunately, it's, it's large, and the reason is exactly Pinsker's inequality. So despite the fact that the, the KL divergence here is epsilon squared, the statistical distance is on the order of epsilon, not epsilon squared. So the probability of making a mistake is not 1 over n, but 1 over square root n, roughly. This means, and we run the protocol for n steps, this means that we will make at least or square root n mistakes, even though the information was just one bit overall. This is very frustrating, right? So the entire information here is like five bits of information. Still, we make a lot of mistakes. And this argument shows that both the Pinsker inequality and the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality are tight for the analysis. So in general, it's not possible to, to improve this. Okay, let me just uh, conclude with you know, the obvious open problem here, can we actually improve and get, you know, in this more general regime of, of compression, can we improve the BBCR compression? So, so far, the counterexample of GKR that Rotem presented rules only compression to i. It doesn't even rule out compression to i times log squared c, let's say. So it's still conceivable that such good compression exists. But if this question is, is, is too hard, then, then how about just just any beating BBCR just by a, by a tiny factor in the exponent will already make us very happy. So this question has been stuck for over four years now. Okay, so th does this make sense? So instead of compressing to i times to square root of i times c, try to get a compression to, let's say, even i to the 10. We, we can afford a polynomial dependence on i, but try to to slice off even a tiny factor from the exponent. So compressed to i to the 10 times c to the 0.4. As we've seen, this already will imply an improved direct sum theorem. So th this, is, and this is kind of the, the barrier at this point. So uh, we still don't know the answer. And um, yeah, so 
One potential approach that almost works is what Rotem insinuated last time. So it turns out that um, another way of, 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 of compressing is to just try and chop off the protocol into small slices of information, then applying a various compression results for each chunk separately. Uh, we've, we managed to reduce this compression uh, task to a potentially easier case. So even if you can improve, even you can, if you can beat the BBCR compression, in the case where the information is really small, is only log C, already this will imply a general improved compression. So this is one concrete uh, open problem. And okay, let's, I'll defer this, we can take this offline just to convince you that you can in fact beat the BBCR compression in special cases. We can see that compression to roughly items poly log C is, or even log log C is, is possible in various, uh, in special cases in restricted models of communication. And yeah, I think uh, from this point, uh, we, part of the purpose of this tutorial was to outsource these open problems, in, in particular this one, which has been stuck for, for, for three or four years. So I think uh, it will be very nice if you guys try and help us out here. Thanks. Okay, so any questions or? Okay, we're off to lunch. Thank you.